Thank you. <laughs> JC 11377, Commonwealth v. Daniel Rosa. Morning, Thank you, Ryan. But, but don't start yet. <laughs> All right, let's begin. Good Thank morning. you. May it please the court, my name is Stuart Graham, counsel for the defendant appellant Daniel Rosa. Mr. Rosa appeals from his conviction for first degree murder. He asserted a number of errors in his brief, but in this argument I'll address only his claim that the admission of a recording of a telephone call he made um, while detained pretrial was error. And secondly, that the court erred in refusing to give a specific unanimity instruction than use a special verdict slip as requested by the defense. The Commonwealth introduced a recording of a telephone call Mr. Rosa made while detained pretrial at the Hamlin County House of Corrections. He moved in limine for exclusion. The court admitted it subject to redaction. Mr. Rosa makes three objections to the recording. First, the content was incomprehensible in significant portions and thus speculative. And second, the pervasive profanity and racial terms used were unduly prejudicial and constituted, in effect, an attack on character. And third, attaining and using the recording violated his constitutional rights. Well, on that last point, I mean, <clears throat> am I right that um, the institutions inform the uh, residents that their conversations will be recorded? Yes, they did. And in fact, um, if during the transcript, it's evident that they're aware of that. They talk about that. Be careful, don't say anything, you're being recorded. I don't think that affects the constitutional violation that we're alleging here. Mr. Rosa had a legitimate expectation of privacy in his telephone calls. <clears throat> That's established in several Supreme Court cases. Now, I understand that is somewhat at odds with this court's holding an in Ray grand jury subpoena which this court held he did not, but I think that conflict must be resolved on the Supreme Court's terms. It's their interpretation of the rights that govern. Um, now, of course, an inmate's constitutional rights or interest in his communications with persons outside the prison can be restricted as necessary um, to accommodate legitimate penological and security interests of the institution. We don't contest that. However, restrictions on the detainee's right to communicate with persons outside the prison um, operate within an area of exception, which leaves those rights and interests in place, except where there is a demonstrated penological need or security interest of the institution which overrides it. Thus, given the holdings of the Supreme Court, his expectation of privacy was legitimate. Again, there's a bit of a conflict between the Supreme Court's test for expectation of privacy and this court's test in in grand jury subpoena in which it held or based its test on a subjective expectation of privacy. The Supreme Court has explicitly never adopted that and rejected it in favor of an objective legitimate expectation of privacy. Given the court's holdings in a number of cases that we outlined in, in the brief, that a detainee has constitutional interest, certainly his expectation of privacy was legitimate. Now, could, could an inmate arrange for someone to put out a, a hit on someone from prison and that would be protected? No, that would not be protected. Um, anytime someone arranges for a hit is a violation of the law. There's nothing protecting <clears throat> that. If you say, can the institution, as just a general matter, restrict an inmate's <clears throat> right to use the telephone to communicate with persons outside the prison in a totally unrestricted way, the answer, I think, is no. That is, the use of the telephone by the inmate cannot be by itself a waiver, an unrestricted waiver of his First Amendment and Fourth Amendment interests in his rights. If but, the institution has, now let me differentiate here, because um, I think this 
may answer your question better, between recording of the conversation and listening to the conversation. Now, Mr. Rosa doesn't, con doesn't uh, contest the fact that the institution has the right to record conversations, which can then be later used when there's some probable cause or administrative cause to listen to the conversation. But those are different issues. Um, requiring a total waiver of his constitutional rights or interests in his communications with people outside the prison would unduly burden those constitutional rights or interests. Again, so they can wait, be wait, restricted. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, just do the second half. You say he doesn't contest his right to record. That's right. Is it so what he's contesting is the institutions handing it over to the prosecution? The institutions, one, listening to the conversation, and then secondly, recording. Uh, well, if he, doesn't, if, he doesn't, if he doesn't contest their right to record and they tell them that they're recording, why doesn't listening to it follow from that? Because there must be some demonstrated justification for listening to it, merely recording it so that in the case of a prison riot or in the case of his being involved in some kind of disciplinary action within the prison, there may be a need to listen to those conversations. That, if sorry. there's evidence from Justice Ireland's question that this individual may have been involved in arranging some criminal action on the outside. What if there isn't any that's evidence yet, but that's need. what he's doing? I'm sorry? What if there isn't any evidence yet, but that's what the, the person is doing, is arranging a hit? Well, when Too people use luck? the telephone every day, um, they do so to arrange all kinds of illegal uh, <coughs> activities, but the government doesn't have the right to listen to their phone call just because they may use the phone to do something illegal. Um, there must be, and the courts have indicated, some demonstrated. United States v. Savage, for example, Ninth Circuit. Um, no doubt there, the <coughs> institution can listen, but there must be, in its terms, a demonstrated justification for it. Not just, you may do something illegal in the future, therefore, we have the right to uh, eliminate your constitutional rights and interests in the privacy of your phone calls. That's not the way the Constitution works. There has to be a demonstration of some need before they listen to it. In this case, there was no such demonstration. Further, the court in Thornburg v. Abbott and other cases held, there has to be some, some institutional regulations, and they have to be applied constitutionally. Two aspects. Here, <coughs> there was no evidence of regulations of the institution that would give them the right or govern the procedure by which they recorded and monitored the, the conversations. Didn't, didn't there was miss, no... Didn't the officer, <coughs> it with an A, but AF something. The, yes. She testified, she testified that there that were she regulations. she did this pursuant to regulations? Period. What regulations? Were they, would they meet a, facially, a facial constitutional challenge? There was no evidence of what they were. Further, there was no criteria developed as to when the institution can listen to conversations. No regulations entered, no criteria established, no demonstrated penological need or interest in listening to his conversation. That burden on the Commonwealth had to be met first so that the court could make a reasoned judgment as to whether justification was shown in this case. The court had nothing upon which to base a decision as to whether the <coughs> institution's actions in this case you know, were constitutional or legal under either mass law or federal law. There's nothing here except an officer saying, oh, we had regulations. What no. regulations? What criteria? Can you, can you prevail if matter of grand jury subpoena stands, or, or must we overrule it for you to prevail? I think it has to be modified perhaps not overruled completely, it has to be modified in terms of the nature of the constitutional interest or right that the individual has in, in, the, in, in the telephone calls and the need for a demonstrated um, justification for monitoring. Again, Mr. Rosa is not asserting that That need they can't has to listen. be particular or that need can be general? That need, um, I think Thornburg the Abbott makes clear that it has to be specific. 
um, not to the individual, but there has to be some established criteria by which the institution can justify listening to a particular inmate's call. So it, maybe this answers your question better. No, it doesn't have to be um, in the regulations particular, but the application of the regulations have to be particular. That is, given the criteria that's established for, for listening to the call, they have to show that the, the evidence should, must show that listening to Mr. Rose's call or a particular inmate call meets that criteria. So it's specific in that sense, but it's a general, a general regulation in, in, in the broader sense. So I think it would have to be modified to that extent. Um, so. But then, then the next step is the, um, if they listen, the providing it to the prosecutor. Or, or is that it, that sort of subsumed because you, you don't, well, let me ask you this. If, the, if they were to show a need to listen, and they do listen, what then? At that point, I think they, that is put them in a similar position in, in say, in a Fourth Amendment case of a, a plain view. That is, they're justified in being where they are. In this case, they would be justified in listening to the, the conversation. I think if and, and, and justified in providing it to the prosecutor? If there's evidence of a crime being committed there, I think yes. Uh, I, I don't think one could argue reasonably that if the institution is legitimately in a position of listening to a conversation and in that legitimate operation comes over evidence of a crime that they can't report it. We're not arguing that. Do I misread what you're arguing, or, or at least what the cases say to which you seem to, on which you seem to rely with it? Were, were those First Amendment cases, by and large? Or were any of those actually Fourth Amendment? There was Amendment? a mixture. Um, <clears throat> Thornberry Abbott was First Amendment. Um, Procuner was First Amendment. Belvey <coughs> Wolfish was Fourth Amendment. Um, Savage, which is a Ninth Circuit case, was Fourth <coughs> Amendment. So there's, there's a combination of all those. And that was about a letter being sent in, opening letters without any... Yes. Yeah. And, but this is, and we're arguing here that he has both the First Amendment and Fourth Amendment rights um, that, were, that were violated by the listening. That is, the, the, the institution could not ban um, all communication of an inmate with the outside world. He has a First Amendment right to do that. So right. at that point, um, you have that right. Then you have to determine how that right can be regulated or restricted and the, the courts have indicated, and this court have indicated, you need some valid regulations right. and some criteria. There was none introduced here. So that's the focus is that not that they're not there, but they weren't. The spe specific regulations on which they're relying for this weren't introduced. That's correct. So the judge had no basis by which to make a decision that this was admissible. No. So it's not that, because I was confused about that, that if, if that had been introduced, you'd, you'd be standing here making this argument. Had they introduced they valid regulations and criteria for listening, pissed, right. and they had introduced some justification for applying that to this case, that's a two-step. Yes, if they're valid regulations, I wouldn't be arguing there were none. But I would still be arguing that they did not demonstrate, pursuant to those regulations, the need in this particular case. There's no evidence of why they listened to his telephone call. <clears throat> Merely listening to the telephone call of a newly detained inmate in order to get some evidence um, of his involvement in the crime for which he's charged is not a legitimate need of the institution. There has to be some reason why they listened here. So yes, if you have regulations, you have valid criteria, you still have to show a storm where the abbot indicate that it was applied constitutionally in the particular case. Um, secondly, we indicate that the recording um, in significant portions was not comprehensible due to what we call street lingo. That is, you listen to this tape, um, you can't understand most of it. You can't understand what they're talking about. There's well, you can get the gist of it, can't you? I mean, he's not happy with certain people, and put aside all of the, the, uh, the, the uh, swearing and the... Uh, 
the bad language. He was saying to the person on the other end, I'm not happy uh, with this fellow. I can't believe he's done. He should have just uh, consistently said I wasn't there. Isn't that the gist of it? Um, that's the gist of part of it. Now, I'm not arguing that this telephone call was, was irrelevant, that there are no relevant statements of Mr. Rosa in the call. What I'm saying is they were embedded in such an unduly prejudicial and incomprehensible context as to make the telephone call overall um, so prejudicial that it outweighed that, that relevance. They could have taken those calls, and, and yes, Your Honor, in point, it does indicate he's unhappy with somebody you know, who's talking against him. That can be excised from that in a transcript that's been sanitized to eliminate <coughs> uh, both to eliminate the racially um, offensive terms that are used and the profanity, which at times is almost every other word, and it makes this conversation almost incomprehensible. That could be removed, and yes, those relevant statements could, could be admitted. The call by itself, I think, is so prejudicial as it stands that no, it could not be used without significant sanitizing. Yes, there are relevant portions. Yes, they, the Commonwealth had every right to use them. And the fact that they're prejudicial, you know, doesn't matter because that's why they want to use them, because well, they are prejudicial. Prejudicial because the jury would view him as a racist, even though he's black? He's not black. He's Hispanic, Your Honor. Okay. So it's because they feared that he would have racial animosity towards blacks through his use of the N-word? I, I think the, the use of that term in, in this telephone call was at times neutral, but most of the time was in derogatory. It was used as a means of, of condemning someone. Secondly, mere use of the term just ignores the, the, the historical derogatory nature of it. I think any juror um, well, let me take that back because he may have had one of his friends on the jury. Most jurors would be offended by the use of that language. Okay, even, even though r rap lyrics are replete with them. I'm not sure that, that most jurors listen to rap, rap music. Um, I don't think I've ever heard a rap song. Um, and Come I don't on, think really? that's common really? to, to jurors. <laughs> And I think when most people listen to that kind of language, <clears throat> most people in the general population are offended by it. But this is a jury. A rational process must be dispassionate. And the, the risk that this kind of language, with, with the, the racial overtones that are used in it, using these terms in a derogatory way to condemn someone, to put them down, that's what was going on here, even though at but times... But mostly, counsel, I mean, I read this, and I, yes, that word is probably used in twice in every sentence when referring to anybody else or themselves. And a, a def defendant explained that that means guy or... You know, it's a, ref it's a broad reference to another person in their cohort, right? At and times. that's how it was used. At and times that, it I is. I think Other if times you watch The Wire, that's how they use it there. I, I mean, you know what I mean? At it's times it was used just inconsistent with just what that happens. way. Other times it was used to identify a particular person that they didn't like, that they wanted to condemn, that they thought what was his actions were indefensible, and they wanted to use it in a derogatory way against that individual. It's that use that is offensive. It's that use that is prejudicial. It's that use that will get to the passions of the jury and uh, prejudice them against the defendant. Yeah. Combine that with the profanity, as I said, which is almost every other word. And the reference, Neither of those terms are relevant to any issue in this case. And, and the reference that's derogatory is made with regard to Mr. Caraballo? It's made to him. It's made to um, other, other people who are saying things about him or uh, talking when they shouldn't talk, and it's used precisely in, in its derogatory sense in those instances. But Mr. Carabello was his friend, and Mr. apparently Carabello accordingly was the main said, remember against... that I love you. Yeah, he was the main witness against him. So and by this wh time, they why, knew why that. would the jury infer racial animosity towards Mr. Carabello when it was plain that 
they were friends. At this point, he's in jail. He's got all the witness statements. They're talking about him. He knows that Mr. Carabello is a main witness against him. They are no longer friends at this point. He is an adversary. He is an enemy. And he is, he is talking against him and using this term in a derogatory way, as well as other people in, in this. Um, I don't want to quibble. They call well, each other that, and it's only derogatory <laughs> when they add the word I was going kids. to say something else. Oh, well, go ahead, and you can wrap it up. I, I'll give you Well, I, I was to going to address the issue of the um, <clears throat> need for jury unanimity um, and accomplice liability, which I think is a major issue facing you know, the court, particularly after Commonwealth v. Zanetti, and why I think that, that case needs it? to be modified. I'm sorry? Why does it need to be modified? Um, in, I in have time to, to address that. I, I would love to. Okay. Um, Zanetti, as your honor knows, displaced Massachusetts joint venture law, or language, I should say, with the common law language and statutory language of compass liability. Making that change and applying the, the common law concept of accomplice liability was long overdue in the Commonwealth. Um, I think the, the analysis of that and the decision is correct. When we moved away from joint venture language to plain accomplice liability. However, moving that movement did not displace the, the Commonwealth's burden of proving accomplice liability beyond a reasonable doubt or jury unanimity on, on that issue. Nor could it eliminate the distinction between principal and accomplice. That's a statutory distinction. The court, I think, in Zanetti called it a false distinction. It's not, it's a real distinction. And it's a distinction maintained by the legislature. And the court has to acknowledge that. The acts which comprise accomplice liability are distinct from those <coughs> required to commit any felony to which someone could be an accomplice. These are distinct acts. It's not part of the murder statute. It's not part of any other statute. A jury must find unanimously that <coughs> the defendant, beyond a reasonable doubt, committed those acts legislatively spelled out in the accomplice statute in order to be held to be an accomplice to any crime. Particularly here, it's murder. Accomplice liability is not part of the murder statute. It requires proof of, proof of acts totally distinct from murder. Um, now, Mr. Graham, I want you to start to wrap it up. Okay. <laughs> yes, Your Honor, I will. Um, as, as they, briefly, then, accomplice liability, they said, is not an element of murder. Um, there are brute facts, and you could be an accomplice by a lot of different ways. You don't need unanimity on that. But you need unanimity on the fact that the person is an accomplice. As Commonwealth v. Richardson said, you've got to prove each action that the Commonwealth says is a criminal action, beyond a reasonable doubt and unanimously. What a person is charged with as being an accomplice is not the same thing as being charged with murder totally distinct acts, statutory acts apart from murder. So you have to prove those acts beyond a reasonable doubt. You can't conflate them, as I think the court tend to do in Zanetti, and say, well, you can just go one way or the other. The jury can have a composite verdict. Some of them believe he's an accomplice. Some of them believe he's a murderer. Well, he participated. OK, he's guilty. That's not due process. He's being charged separately with accomplice liability and separately with murder. Each of those must be proved unanimously and beyond a reasonable doubt. And therefore, the jury should have been instructed that they must be unanimous as whether he's an accomplice or a principal, and a special verdict slip should be used. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. May it please the court. I'm Marcia Julian, uh, representing the Commonwealth today from the Hamden County District Attorney's Office. Um, and I will address the issues that my brother addressed. Uh, and, I, uh, and unless the court has questions on the other issues, I would otherwise rest on my brief. 
Um, first, I guess it kind of an overarching principle that um, as I sat and listened, um, I, I, I think that it, it's important to remember that, um, that the Commonwealth um, and the trial court is guided by the, the settled decisions of this court. And I think that that principle pertains squarely to, to the issues that my brother argued today. Um, and starting with um, his, his constitutional challenge um, to the admission of the jail call in this case, I think that there are some contextual matters that are really important to, to consider first. And that's that this challenge was not raised before the trial court. There was a motion in limine from the Commonwealth to admit the, the call, and there was a motion in limine from the defense to exclude the call. And the defense made three arguments in its motion, and it also made the same three arguments uh, to the trial court when the, when the court heard the motion. And, um, and I invite the court to read the same transcript I read, and it's nowhere in there, uh, and it certainly is not in the motion. So this was not addressed to the trial court. It was not challenged by the defense. Um, the testimony of uh, Officer Athis was not challenged in that regard. It simply was not an issue. But I would suggest that, the, that, that to the extent um, uh, there, there uh, is a necessity for such a foundation, um, that uh, it, was, it, was, it was present on this record. Um, in fact, there was, and I digress for a moment, when uh, there was even discussion at two points in the transcript where the judge sought clarification as to whether or not there was a pretrial challenge to the jail telephone call, either on fourth, well, he asked on Fourth Amendment grounds. There was no discussion about First Amendment grounds at any point, but in any event, it was confirmed that there was no such challenge. Um, it, it, while discussing the motions in limine, there was another motion in limine um, that the defense brought to exclude gang references. And, um, uh, and, I, and I'd like to correct a citation at page 45 of my brief. Um, I accidentally cite to transcript volume 1B, page 35. It should be 1A, page 35. That day there, were, um, there was a morning and an afternoon session, and this occurred in the morning session. Um, the district attorney explained that while this case was not about the defendant's gang affiliations, um, the jail telephone call, the unredacted version of the jail telephone call, might lend itself to some suggestion that he was a, a gang member. Um, and so part and parcel of both motions, there was a discussion about the necessity of redacting um, and being careful about the jail tape. And I, as a side note, I, I would... I'd like to uh, inform the court, and I'm sure you've seen it, that I included in the Commonwealth's appendix the unredacted jail tape, the redacted jail tape, and the transcript that is, was helpful but is not a verbatim transcript, uh, but was, did guide the court in making its decision. And it was extensively discussed, um, roughly over 80 pages of transcript before it was admitted. Um, but in any event, uh, in the discussion about um, the, the motion to exclaim, exclaim, uh, exclude gang references, um, the district attorney agreed uh, that there would not be any gang references, but he explained to the court that um, the defendant's gang membership was relevant to the monitoring and recording of his telephone calls. And then he talked about Officer Athos's um, written report that she prepared and provided to the Springfield Police Department, which is appended, was appended both to the motion to exclude the gang references and is in the defendant's appendix to his brief. And, um, and, it, and it's interesting because I think that there is more of a foundation in her testimony um, than the defendant would have you believe. And I would refer the court to the transcript dated June 27th uh, when uh, Officer Athos testified and at page 84, in direct examination, um, she's explaining um, that she's an intelligence officer and what that entails, um, including reviewing inmate mail, monitoring inmate telephone calls, and conducting interviews with inmates. And that she did this in this case. She doesn't um, interview everyone. And the uh, district attorney asked her, um, 
Do you conduct interviews of all persons who come to the facility? No, not all persons. All right, will you identify a number of persons to make sure you have a group that you do identify? Yes. I mean, it may be circumspect, but he was being very careful not to tread on, on uh, why he was singled out. But if you look at that report, um, and the name escapes me, it was something, the, something disciples, but anyway, he was identified as uh, within an inmate risk group, a security risk group, and it's, it's right in the report. Um, and the references, uh, there's a reference to BOSS, which is the Brothers of the Supreme something. Well, anyway, um, he, he was identified uh, at an intake point as somebody who required uh, monitoring. And, and, and that is specifically a legitimate penological interest. And uh, I would suggest that the argument that as applied to this individual, to the defendant, um, it, it was appropriately applied. And I would suggest that the federal cases, the Supreme Court cases, recognize that those are decisions that have to be made by prison officials. Can, can I ask you this, are, are all telephone calls say other than attorney-client calls monitored and recorded? Well, according to her testimony, um, at, uh, I'm sorry, that was re regarding interviews. If you look at the regulations, um, which I've appended, um, um, <clears throat> I don't think it's possible. Um, I'm not sure that that question was asked. But I don't think it would be possible to um, listen to um, a record. All, yes. No, they're all recorded. They're all recorded. They're all recorded because, if in fact, if you listen to the um, to the disc that I've appended to my brief, it's prefaced by that announcement that this right. call is being recorded, and um, that's a, a condition um, of acceptance of the pin and so forth in the regulations that- In, in terms uh, of being listened to, there's this narrower band of identified individuals. Well, in his case, and, and, I, and I, I, think it, I think it's limited to as applied to him if the court's going to entertain this late, mm -hmm. you know, this, this newly raised argument. Um, I'm just asking sort of no. overall questions. Of process yeah, I'm sorry, here. and I and and I um, and, and I'm I'm afraid that um, because uh, this challenge wasn't made, that type of a record yeah. wasn't developed. Fair enough. Um, but but I would um, direct the court to um, uh, addendum. Oh, I don't have the page. I'm sorry, but it is uh, the CMR 482.05, which is the definitions. And the definition of telephone monitoring is the monitoring and or recording of telephone conversations of an inmate. Um, so uh, it, it, I, I think that it was certainly appropriate under the circumstances that prevailed in this case that his telephone calls were monitored in the sense of recorded and listened to um, and that uh, um, there was uh, certainly no curtailment of, of, of his rights in derogation of, of any constitutional protections. Um, and in fact, um, when um, in cross-examination, when trial counsel um, asked whether or not the warning included a warning that this may be turned over to law enforcement, um, the, the district attorney asked to conduct a limited inquiry and redirect examination um, because he had promised to stay away from that area, but now he felt that he needed to uh, provide some explanation. So that um, in redirect examination, she, in a, in a very careful way, said, um, yes, it was done in this case because there were reasons for doing this case without saying what those reasons were. So, um, so I would suggest that, um, that uh, it certainly, um, as applied in this case, uh, doesn't violate any of the defendant's does, constitutional the, uh, protections. I'm how sorry. does the district attorney get it? I'm sorry. How does the district attorney get it after? Okay, it's recorded and it's in this case listened to, and then by subpoena. Yes, under fact, Rule 17 or yes, a Rule 17 subpoena, and I've appended the Commonwealth's motion to my brief. Um, I mean, the, the the report when you read it, it's fairly obvious why it was provided to the Springfield Police Department. And I think that this court has said, um, in confirming the principles of the matter of grand jury subpoena case, um, and uh, that it's natural to think that that once this information comes to the attention of prison officials, that they will provide the information to law enforcement. 
um, that over and over again, uh, these principles have been upheld. And again, um, I would suggest that the Commonwealth, uh, you know, and the trial court should be able to rely on, on those cases, uh, particularly where it's here. There isn't the type of record um, that, uh, that is suggested that should have been made because the challenge wasn't made. I mean, the, the officer did testify that she was, um, she was operating pursuant to written policies and procedures. And because there was no challenge, the Commonwealth was not required to introduce the Sheriff's Department's written policy, uh, which it also would have had to have obtained with a Rule 17 subpoena, I would suggest. Um, so as to, uh, I would suggest also that um, the, uh, the judge properly exercised his discretion um, to admit the defendant's statements of a party opponent made in the jail call for um, a number of reasons that were completely relevant um, in the case. And that um, uh, the, the argument about the uh, offensive nature of the language, it, it, it's quite true, but I think that when you have an opportunity to review the record, it's clear that great pains were taken to exclude irrelevant and unduly prejudicial information. And to the extent the language could be parsed out, it was without interrupting the con uh, context. When you listen to the conversation, oftentimes the two people are talking over each other. Uh, you know, as far as it was practical to do it, the Commonwealth tried to sanitize it to the extent that it could and, and basically reached an agreement with defense counsel. There were some contested points. Um, as to the, uh, the uh, suggestion that um, uh, it should have been excluded because of the defendant's use of, uh, of, of that language, um, uh, again, he defined it. Um, it was the common parlance between the two individuals, and I would submit that you're not going to find one instance where it was used as a racial slur. It was, um, he agreed it was a term of endearment, and he used it in a derogatory fashion when he was unhappy with somebody. Um, in terms of the um, whether or not find it in his testimony at trial, you he said. did, he did. But, but I mean, if there was a problem, you can't rely on the fact that he chose to testify to cure it, can you? Um, <clears throat> Well, um, I think, no, I, 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 I mean, it was obviously admitted and maybe he testified in part um, to respond to the tape. I, would I mean, I'm not saying there was, a, but it seems to me just theoretically, if there were a problem with it, it, it seems to me not exactly correct that you can justify the Commonwealth's case by, by then using what he happens to say when he... Well, uh, no, but I mean, I, 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 think, it's, I think it's informative um, uh, from the court's perspective because it's consistent with what you will hear when you listen to it. Um, and that, again, it's a question of weighing uh, the probative value versus its prejudicial value. And um, in this case, uh, the, uh, um, the probative value of his statements uh, outweighed their prejudicial value. Um, I don't think it was an obscure, difficult thing to understand. They were isolated portions, 23 of them separated by 20 seconds of silence. Um, and I would suggest from context, it's pretty clear what he was talking about. And in other instances, particularly with regard to ballistics evidence, the uh, Commonwealth's uh, ballistician clarified some of those points. Um, as to the final argument, um, I would, uh, as to the special verdict slipped in specific unanimity, I would rest on the Commonwealth's brief and this court's decision <coughs> in Zanetti and the cases that have affirmed that aspect of the Zanetti decision. Uh, again, it's settled law, and I think the judge was properly guided by it, and there was no error. If the court has no further questions, I would otherwise rest on my brief. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. Court, all right.